The Salish Sea is one of the world's most amazing ecosystems, overflowing with life, and it's the best place on earth to be a wildlife veterinarian. Join me, Joe Gatos, and Team Sea Doc as we explore the natural wonders of the Pacific Northwest in Salish Sea Wild. Occupying an ecological niche between dabbling ducks, like this magnificent wood duck that uses freshwater habitat, and true seabirds like our friend the tufted puffin that depends on ocean waters, is a gorgeous group of birds called the sea ducks. Harlequins, mergansers, long tails, golden eyes, buffle heads. These are all sea ducks that spend much of their year in the Salish Sea. And though they're locally common, we know less about sea ducks than we do about almost every other kind of bird in North America. Today we're concerned about one sea duck species in particular because its west coast population has crashed by more than 50%. This is the surf scoter. While female surf scoters are camouflage brown, males have jet black feathers and big candy corn bills. They sport a bright white spot on their foreheads and a single Pepe Le Pew stripe on the back of their necks. That stripe is what inspired their nickname, Skunkhead. Scoters aren't very vocal, but they're big birds that need to get a running start and flap like crazy to take off from the water. This creates a distinctive whoop 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 sound as they take wing. Surf scoters are difficult to study because they nest up north in the boreal forest. That's 1.5 billion acres of subarctic woods and wetlands that stretch across the top of North America. It's so vast and hard to access that we're still trying to figure out which specific places are important to the birds and whether their decline is due to problems up there, down here, or both. If only there was a way to get the scoters themselves to tell us exactly where they go and which habitats we need to protect for them. Hey there, Mr. Scoter. How would you like to be an official skunkhead scientist? just after 3 a.m. on a cold, rainy winter's night. At a marina on the U.S.-Canadian border, a groggy gang of researchers huddles around a chart plotter to plan their mission. But with the winds, I think our best options are is to set a net here off of this, inside the shoal. SeaDoc is on board, along with a flock of biologists from all over Washington state, including local tribes. Ready? Okay. Despite the early hour and miserable conditions, spirits are high. The research vessel Harlequin will serve as our mini mothership, acting as a floating lab and supporting two teams operating from small inflatables. Loaded to the gills with gear, the Harlequin sets off. It's great weather for ducks. Fortunately, that's exactly what we're looking for. We're lucky to have Fish and Wildlife's Joe Evenson leading the effort. Joe's been studying waterfowl and seabirds for decades, and his research has made critical contributions to multiple Sea Doc Society science papers. Joe spent yesterday scouting the area. In winters past, he's seen thousands of surf scoters out here. Now, he's lucky to see a hundred. We've got to solve the mystery of the disappearing skunk heads. To help do that, we need to briefly capture a few and enlist them in a tracking study. Of course, that's easier said than done. Scoters spend the night offshore and then fly to their shallow feeding grounds at first light. Our best chance is to catch them during that move. That's why we're out here in the wee hours. There's a ton of prep work to do and we're racing the sunrise to be ready when the scoters show up. The safest way to capture birds is with mist nets. So our plan is to stretch them across places where Joe thinks the birds will travel. While the nets may be safe for the birds, setting them in open water is a dicey job for the scientists. Floating mist nets require a complicated system of anchors, 
pulleys, tension lines, and buoyant hubs. All of this built and deployed by headlamp from a rocking boat. This is what field biology is all about. The final touch is to position two strings of skunk head decoys downwind of the nets. It's easier for large birds like scoters to take off into the wind. If any land among the decoys, they should flush towards the nets. Thawn breaks just as the capture team finishes setting up. We can already hear the scoters flying overhead. The inflatables move off so they don't spook the birds. Mother Nature is forecast to throw a bit of everything at us today. Rain, wind, even some sunshine. Just a typical winter's day in the Salish Sea. And now we wait. <laughs> Just as the capture crew starts to break out the hot coffee and hand warmers, a low flying duck splashes down amid the decoys. Joe uses the boat to coax the bird in the right direction and then flushes it into the net. Our first volunteer. It's a white winged scoter, the surf scoter's big cousin. White wings are another boreal breeding sea duck species that we need to learn more about. We'll hang on to this guy for a bit to collect some data and give him a leg band. Seeing a bird tangled in a mist net looks alarming, but a large peer-reviewed study showed that the chance of even a minor injury to the animal is less than 1%. Birds we catch go into customized cat carriers. Inside, they rest on a hammock that keeps them comfortable and allows us to collect any duck droppings. When the sky's clear, it's suddenly a lovely morning, though we worry that our nets are now too visible. But it's not long before we start nabbing more birds in the name of science. A long tail. This beauty is a smaller breed of sea duck than the scoters. Unfortunately, it's another species suffering an unexplained decline. Our next contestant is an adorable little sea duck called a harlequin. Small but tough, harlequins are the only duck that nests along mountain streams and raises their young to shoot the rapids. We've seen them off the coast, happily paddling amid crashing waves. West Coast harlequin populations are stable, but they're sensitive to water quality issues and vulnerable to oil spills. He won't get a tracker but we'll take some samples to check on his health and diet. Boy, that is a gorgeous bird, holy cow. We're catching sea ducks, but our primary targets, the surf scoters, are steering clear of the nets. They're out here and attracted to our decoys, but they seem to suspect something fishy's going on. We're flying in. Yeah, I see it. This looks good. Ow, this looks really good. Finally, one flies into the mist net. It's a great looking male, and he appears plenty big to carry one of our tiny transmitters. We'll find out for sure when we weigh him. So we need to radio in the cage number. Two six. With several birds on board the capture boat, it's time to head to the mothership and turn them over to the sampling team. <laughs> Last week we were talking about Each duck is weighed and gets a unique ID band. 882. We band birds to help us understand migration, population, survival, and lifespan. Yep, 177. Sea ducks are game birds harvested by recreational and subsistence hunters. So it's critical we collect information to properly manage seasons and quotas. Here we go. Biologist Callie Moore then takes a few drops of blood from each duck's leg. Like your doctor's blood draw, this will check general health and fitness to determine if the birds are getting enough high quality food to see them through the long Pacific Northwest winter. Okay, we're gonna process fecal for- Evidence of what goes in one end of an animal always comes out the other. Poop is precious to wildlife biologists. These samples will tell us exactly what the birds have been feeding on. You want to scoop some in directly for into anyone hoping for a career in wildlife science, you must learn to embrace the glamorous part of the job. 
like mining for Sorry. green gold amid the Scoter scat. Nope. Get the good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so right here. I'll, uh... This laid back dude of a duck is our long yeah, tail. He's what biologists so. call a hatch year. This means he was born just four or five months ago, somewhere in the Arctic tundra, even further north than the Scoters. When he matures and molts into his breeding plumage, he'll grow the flamboyant long tail feathers that give the species its name. Long tails can dive deeper than any other duck, down to at least 200 feet, where they forage for mollusks and crustaceans. It's almost time. Birds that aren't getting a tracker are quickly released. All right. While every duck we capture provides important research data, only birds above a certain age and weight are candidates for a GPS tracker. Of course, send them off. We would want something we're doing to affect their behavior or chances for survival. This longtail has just had the most bizarre morning of his entire life. He preens, takes a drink, and shakes his tail feathers, telling us he's doing just fine. Once everyone is released except our tracking candidates, we head back to shore. Our temporary vet clinic is a fish and wildlife trailer set up near the boats. Okay, what do we got? All meals. Yep. These birds are very important to us and to their populations. We treat them like members of the family and use the latest in veterinary techniques and technology. Even though the scoters seem remarkably calm, we give them an intranasal sedative to minimize any stress from handling. They're under full anesthesia for placement of the tag. And during the procedure, Fish and Wildlife vet tech Diana Lamborn keeps careful watch over their blood oxygen level, heart rate, and body temperature. We know that these birds need to go right back to feeding in the cold water and avoiding eagle-eye predators. So we also give them subcutaneous fluids to make sure they're hydrated and an anti-inflammatory painkiller to make sure they're feeling good. After getting the transmitter, the bird goes into our recovery room, which means someone's lap. Here, it's Sea Doc Society's research assistant and wildlife biologist, Sarah Taman, who's been dreaming of the chance to see a surf scoter close up. To ensure our patients are fully alert for their release back to the wild, we undo the sedation by giving them a snoot full of antidote. Sarah will gently hold the duck while it comes around. And later, we'll search her car, just to make sure her dreams don't include keeping a scoter in her bathtub. While the ducks are still drowsy, we take the opportunity to check out their distinctive markings and that great, big, beautiful beak. This is a highly evolved instrument. The vivid colors are all about showing off to prospective mates, but the form is pure function. Surf scoter bills are plow shaped so they can dig into the bottom to scarf up clams and other invertebrates. That wicked hook on the tip, which has drawn blood from more than one biologist, enables them to pry mussels off rocks. What a magnificent bird. Once we're sure the scoters are fully recovered, it's back aboard the Harlequin for a trip out into Bellingham Bay. Joe makes an educated guess about where our bird's buddies will be rafted up. So where I want to check for is in this area here. So the ones from the south. And he's right on the money. It's time for the release. I like when you're biting me. <laughs> <laughs> By adding a small GPS tracker, we've turned this duck into a scoter scientist. And he's gonna go out and do field research and help us understand why his population is declining. Are you ready, little guy? I hope so. Yeah, he's ready. Okay, you bionic bird. Get out there and help us save the Salish Sea surf scoters. You got this. This guy looks great. He shrugs off the experience and gets right back to doing scoter stuff. This sea ducks tag is designed to transmit for more than a year. From it, we'll learn which Salish Sea habitats are important to surf scoter survival during the winter and spring. Then, 
When it's time to breed, we'll track his migration to find out exactly where he lands in the boreal forest. It's our responsibility to figure out the issues, fix the problems, and recover wildlife. After releasing our last patient and watching him rejoin his flock, we hang out for a bit to bird watch. We spot a party of longtails. They're just as chatty as the scoters are silent. These males are really working their extravagant tail feathers to impress the ladies. The longtails and other sea ducks pair up for mating while they're here in the Salish Sea. Some, like the harlequins, will be choosing mates for life. Hi, this is Joe Gatos of the Sea Doc Society. Thanks for watching. Click over here to check out more episodes of Salish Sea Wild. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you can join Team Sea Doc on all our adventures. Thank you.